It was a Carlisle sibling tradition that we screwed with each other. All siblings do it, right? It's practically the status quo to have a love-hate relationship with your brothers and sisters. However, coming from a powerful family of blood witches on our mother's side, these screwing with each other reach the levels of extreme, which is the standard for young witches. When we were little kids, it was small charms and spells which didn't require that much siphoning. Maybe a light prick of the finger, or even a paper cut, which was pretty easy for me. When I was eight at our aunt's wedding, I put a spell on my older brother to only say the word poop during his speech for the newlyweds. I was the only one who found it funny and was grounded for almost a month. Worth it. Growing older, the pranks on each other could go slightly over the top. I was 11 when I missed an interview for a fancy boarding school for witches after my little sister put a charm on my bedroom handle. I was locked in my room all day and our mom received a call from the principal screaming at her for wasting the school's time. When my sister was questioned, she looked guilty and told me she didn't want me to go. When I grilled her further that night, she also commented that when I grilled her further that night, she also commented that it was also because I'd made the offhand joke her boyfriend looked like a dead hedgehog. The amount of petty in my family is almost comical. It's not like I had much of a chance at a modern magical boarding school, due to certain things I will get into. But I still wanted that Hogwarts experience. Regardless of the fictional world being next to nothing like reality, magic in the real world is pretty chill. The media had definitely turned it into something, it definitely is not. But if anything, it just puts us further under the radar and is harder to spot. I can tell you now, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that you live near a witch and have zero idea. Humans have built this aesthetic around us for centuries, and we just go along with it. It's kind of cute. It's kind of cute. For example, it is common knowledge to humans that we consider cats as our familiars, when in actuality, witches, or at least blood witches, are allergic. I found that out the hard way after trying to convince mom to adopt a kitten, only to finally get one and have a sneezing fit which led me into the emergency room. Mom's motto is basically, fuck around and find out. I've also come to realize that in human media, male witches are considered warlocks. No, they're just witches, regardless of their gender. I dropped out of mom's magical homeschool several years ago, so I don't know the ins and outs of being a witch and the world our mother left behind. I know basic magic, just small spells and charms that only require moving my lips slightly or uttering single words and phrases. So like opening locks or charms to find lost things. Sometimes I used animal blood as a substitute, but it doesn't work as well as human blood. Which is annoying. I realized that when the spell I had put on my brother to seal his lips and keep him from proposing to his girlfriend, he was 16 years old and dating a girl I was pretty sure only wanted him for his powers. And she ran out halfway through. I had been very careful and made sure to use a rabbit as a sacrifice, but the spell didn't go as well as I wanted it to. The good news is that my brother's proposal speech was scuffed enough to fuck it up with him muffling half of it. And the bad news is that I was once again grounded for a month. However, I classify that instance as saving my brother instead of screwing him over. Three weeks after the proposal, the girl admitted her family was using her to get his powers and would have killed him if she didn't stop them. The girl's family really thought that killing Levi would give them his powers. That's kind of funny. Did they really think magic is contagious or can be absorbed? How exactly were they planning on absorbing my brother's power? Despite this teasing and screwing around, my siblings and I shared a special connection. I could badmouth Levi to his face multiple times and then ask him five minutes later if he wanted Chipotle. Matilda and I fought all the time over her wearing my clothes, but when she was upset, she would tell me everything like I was her personal therapist. 
No matter how down or upset I was, I always had them cheering me up in any way they could. Mom said under no circumstances were we to use magic in public. But who doesn't use magic in 2023? I notice it in passersby sometimes if I'm really looking. It's not hard to spot a witch in public. Lips moving curtly to cool down coffee and turn pages of books. I even saw a guy hail a cab with a spell. Like siphoning blood from living things, we can also siphon from ourselves. Though it can weaken us. It can depend on a lot of things, like age or the amount of power you have. If you're a fully healthy 20 year old trying to use a lost and found charm to find your phone and siphon a quarter of a teaspoon from yourself, you're good. If you're a novice witch over 3,000 years old, siphoning partially from yourself for a complicated transmutation spell, you're also good. However, if you're a 22 year old witch with an extremely rare blood disease, you're going to have a problem. Once again, who can't use magic in 2023? Me. I can't use magic. Oh, the irony. Yes, I come from a royal line of witches, with my mother being an estranged princess who chose her kids over her heritage. And yes, I should be as powerful as my siblings, who by their teenagehood were running circles around me in terms of progress. Matilda could successfully boil the blood of someone's veins if she wanted to and Levi could go leagues further and actually control the blood of a person, allowing him to slip inside their brain. I call it body snatching, though the fancy word a mother used was transference. I can't do transference. I can't boil blood or evaporate it or control it. I can't even siphon my own in fear of a one-way trip to the grave. Unlike my siblings, who can use blood whenever they like to cast spells or charms, or even just cut themselves and not face consequences. I can't. I was cursed from birth with hemophilia, which is a rare blood disease that stops blood from clotting in your veins and can essentially cause you to bleed to death if you can't control it. So Levi and Matilda inherited our mother's powers while I was stuck with dad's hemophilia. A hemophiliac fell in love with a blood witch. I'm not one for astrology or destiny, but I did find it ironic that mom and dad fit so well. It's not that hemophilia is a debilitating disease for a human. Most people can live a normal and functioning life with no problems, except maybe a trip to the emergency room every few years for a checkup. For a blood witch, however, I'm a joke at family gatherings. When I was four, mom abandoned her family in coven after a fallout with her grandma. So we had lived a mostly normal human life. Mom did have witch friends, however, who threw parties as I grew up. And at those parties, I would be the punching bag. Your daughter is a hemophiliac blood witch? Mom's friend Jason would regularly come over to hang out with her when we were little. And I would hear him laughing. He didn't even try to hide his amusement. The asshole would be three beers down, lounged in our couch with a stupid fucking smile, lazily flicking through the TV channels with his pointer finger. Like the TV remote wasn't three fucking inches from him. But it's not like I could blame the idiot. One spell equaled a trip to the emergency room, or if I could control it, a whole lot of bandages and trauma. As you can probably tell, I failed at pretty much everything magic related, because too much blood equaled more power, but closer to death. At 14, I got jealous of my brother and sister perfecting body hopping, which is essentially taking over the blood of a person's body and taking over their consciousness. Envious of them passing their exam with flying colors, I had slashed in my hand and managed to perfect it too, but more bleeding accumulated more power. That night ended in both me and my volunteer sitting in the emergency room trying to staunch bleeding I knew wouldn't stop without a shot. I was in the emergency room a lot, from never-ending nosebleeds causing me to faint, to grazing my knee and losing half a pint. This wasn't normal in humans, 
and as accidents and trips to the hospital piled up, I started to wonder if it was because I was a witch. As I got older, it got worse. I can remember being as young as seven or eight, coming into my powers and siphoning my own blood to pluck a candy car from the shelf in the store. I could still do limited magic with a pricked finger at 12. So why did it fuck me over in teenagehood? I mean, royally screwed me over. I couldn't do anything because one single cunt meant no clotting. Mom went to a private doctor whose specialty was either magic caused disease or human diseases in young witches. He confirmed my suspicions. My powers were debilitating me even more, and my blood wasn't stable if I continued to use magic. I was killing myself. The doctor didn't try to sugarcoat it and told me straight. It was either I slapped away from magic altogether and waited to turn 18 and receive a blood transfusion, or stubbornly continued to use magic and slowly bleed to death. I dropped out of magic homeschool, effective immediately. Mom didn't even try to hide her relief. I knew from childhood that she was reluctant in teaching us magic after leaving her coven behind. But she also had three kids slowly manifesting magical abilities, and it's not like she could ignore it. Her classes were always shortened to the point on Sunday evenings after dinner. Mom tried to smile and tell us the positives of magic. But her smile was always too wide, her teeth too far gritted for her smile to be genuine. She hated magic, but in her words, she felt it was her responsibility to train us in case we were ever in a difficult situation against witches. I didn't understand what she meant by that. From my knowledge, our own circle of witches and mom's friends were nice enough. I could tolerate Jason and other covens usually kept to themselves, only growing territorial if something was taken from them. Centuries ago, there was bad blood between covens, but before I could learn our history, I dropped out of classes. Matilda and Levi saw me dropping out as a personal attack, despite knowing it was either magic or my life. That definitely put a strain on our relationship. When I turned 18, instead of following in their footsteps and attending some fancy university that specialized in training witches for magic-specific jobs, I attended a normal college for normal humans, or half-witches who were turned away from magical institutions. By magic college, I don't mean a hidden castle in Scotland that is only accessible through a brick wall. Every university and college globally has a program you can only get into if you are a witch. Anyway, cutting a long explanation short, I left home five years ago and had not spoken or communicated with my siblings since Jason's holiday party two years prior. When he got drunk, called me a mistake, and laughed in my face. I was also slightly tipsy and jealous that Levi and Matilla had been getting all the attention as newly minted NYU students and threw my drink in his face. That party brought a lot of things out in the open. I straight up told my siblings I hated them for not supporting me when I dropped out of homeschool. And they shot back with, well, maybe if you got the blood transfusion. What they didn't seem to understand was, even if I got the transfusion, I wouldn't be a fully blooded Carlisle anymore. They didn't care. In their minds, if I got the transfusion, then we could be siblings again, and I could enroll in whatever pretentious magic classes that they were taking. No, that's not the real world. If I got the transfusion, I wouldn't be considered a Carlisle, no matter how powerful I was. I told them that, which collapsed into an argument ending me locking myself in my room like a baby. I haven't talked to them since. Three years had gone by and I had been living a nice, mostly magic-free life. I say mostly because my roommate's girlfriend was a half-witch who had been rejected from every college she applied to purely because of her family's lack of power. I was working part-time at a small cafe on campus. It was a stuffy afternoon in mid-June when I came face-to-face -face with, quite literally, 
with the reason why my mother had run away from her coven. There weren't many customers, and I was oddly talking to a guy who seemed nice enough. He was cute, had a great smile, and a perfect amount of stubble to appear both manly and boyish. This guy was a catch that I hadn't even been expecting. He liked all my favorite books, shared my music taste. Johnny, I think he was called. He didn't look like a Johnny. At first impressions, I thought he was maybe a Sam or a Jasper. Definitely from my city. Kind of pretentious, but in an endearing way. The guy was wearing a trench coat for fuck's sake. Leaning against the counter with my arms folded across my chest, I was enjoying the seemingly never-ending tale of the time he almost got eaten by a croc. I jumped when Johnny suddenly face-planted. It came out of nowhere. He was halfway through his comical tale, laughing at all the funny parts, barely able to get through it without cracking up. And then, he was face-planting the counter. Initially, I thought he was drunk. I poked him with not much of a reaction. Quickly, I started to realize something was wrong. I was reaching into my apron to pull out my phone when Johnny lifted his head, blinking rapidly, and I couldn't resist a laugh. I suspected it, but I had to be sure, because part of me was actually scared this poor guy had dropped dead mid-conversation. However, it wasn't hard to spot another Carlisle. It can be various factors, but it's usually our smell, which is the aroma of crushed fall leaves mixed with spicy apples. I loved the scent as a kid. It felt like home, like nothing could happen to me. In this instance, however, the smell was more of an unwelcome attack on my nose and throat, choking me. He must have been hiding it ten minutes earlier. The door had swung open and slammed shut with no sign of wind. While making Johnny's third or fourth coffee, I watched a hooded figure make their way to the back of the cafe and slump into a seat. Now I knew their identity. Johnny's demeanor had completely changed. Instead of sitting half slumped, clearly drunk, he straightened up. Running his hand through his hair, I recognized that all too familiar glitter around his iris. Hard to see with the human naked eye, but in plain sight to a witch, a purplish glitter around the iris resembling stardust. I had seen it so many times when I was a kid when my sibling's body hopped through control in someone's blood, easily managing to step into a human body with not so much as a quirk of their lips and a single drop of blood drawn from their hand. Levi wasn't being inconspicuous. I could see his body or his soulless shell, still sitting in the back of the cafe. The cuff of his sleeve was stained, revealing red. Johnny cleared his throat, and with my brother speaking in his iris, he leaned forward with a challenging smile. I could tell years apart had put a strain on that smile I used to find familiar. And home. Now, it was spiteful, curled with distaste at speaking to me. I didn't blame him, I guess. The Carlisle siblings were supposed to stay together, which was a pact we had made as kids. I had broken that pact. Now, I was left with the burden of that choice I had made, burning in Johnny's face, carved with my brother's hatred. After giving me the mother of all glares, his gaze flicked behind me. He pointed to a drink's menu. Could I just have the coffee? He asked. On the house, right? Since we're siblings. Oh, yes. My body-snatching brother. I smiled through my teeth. It's nice to see you. He chuckled. Your sarcasm needs work. I ignored him, trying to ignore how powerful my brother had become. Body hopping was his kryptonite as a teenager, with him only being able to remain in control for half a minute. There was a specific tactic to body hopping. Stay calm and collected, and keep your volunteer, or in Levi's case, his victim, calm. When he was a kid, Levi used to murmur reinsurances to his volunteer, where his possessions always had consent. This, however, seemed to be the opposite. 
Mom had drilled it into us that human life was precious and that we were never ever to use our powers on them. So, why the change of heart? Something cold slithered through me, unwelcome, the tingy legs of a spider entangling itself around my spine. What exactly were they teaching him in magic school? Swallowing my panic, I straightened up. He could read my mind. So could Matilda. They learned it during their late teens, and my private thoughts were quickly brought out into the open. I cringed at the feeling of his energy, his powers suffocating me like I was being pulled to the depths of the ocean. I had never been in the presence of this kind of ability and power, and seeing it in his aura, in his eyes, the air crackling around me. I was terrified of my brother for the first time in my life. In reading my mind, he knew exactly that. Lips curving into a smile. What are you doing here, Levi? He shrugged, losing his smile. Someone is watching you. His response twisted my gut. But my brother was known for playing stupid pranks. I wouldn't put it past him at the age of 22. Funny. He raised a brow. You think I'm joking? When aren't you? I hissed out, finally losing my cool. I prodded him in the forehead. What is this? You're hurting people now? Levi rolled his eyes. Classic Levi. You weren't going to listen to me if I just came over, he said, a lilt of a whine to his tone. I don't care, I gritted out. Get out of my customer, or I'm grabbing your body and hauling your ass to the trash can. He leaned back. I'll tell mom. I'll tell dad. Levi inclined his head. You're not talking to dad. You're not talking to dad either, I pointed out. Where's Maddie? His lip curled. Why do you care? I don't, I said. I'm just curious if this is a duo thing. Is she going to ambush me in my apartment? I caught hurt flash in his eyes for a moment. We're not monsters, you know. Then get out of my customer, I said. Mom told us. You haven't spoken to mom. He shot back. How would you know what she teaches us? I don't care, I spluttered. You're killing someone. If you want to talk to me, come over in your own body. I couldn't resist a laugh. But you won't, because you can't look me in the eye, can you? None of you can, because I'm not considered a Carlisle anymore. Levi frowned. That is not... I didn't need this. I was too warm and stuffy. Just please leave him, I whispered. Can't you sense his fear? He opened his mouth to presumably argue with me, which I knew neither of us wanted. So instead, he sighed. Someone is watching you. And if they're watching you, they're watching all of us. I caught a thin line of red escaping Johnny's nostril my heart leaping into my throat. The first sign of an internal hemorrhage caused by too much magic buildup in the blood was a nosebleed, followed by heart failure. According to mom, magic in large quantities can be like poison to human bodies, and my idiot brother was drowning the poor guy. Levi just settled me with a, really, look, before exaggerating a sigh. He shot me a fake grin. Fine. But remind me to tell you, I told you so. Johnny's head was barely touching the counter before my brother jumped up from his seat, back in his body, pocketed his phone, and swiftly made his way to the door, not even glancing at me. I finally glimpsed his face as he left. He looked just as insufferable as he used to, with dark brown curls hanging in a pale face, uneven freckles, and a too narrow nose. Levi was the definition of a witch and had a pretentious style of dressing, sporting a long jacket over black pants and a t-shirt. I watched him stride back down the sidewalk with his hands in his pockets. Uh... Johnny was coming too, slowly, lifting his head and swiping at his bloody nose. Thankfully, there was a memory erasure spell to go with body hopping. Thank God Levi had used it. Uh, uh, what, what the fuck, what the fuck just happened? Johnny laughed after three unsuccessful attempts to get my attention. 
which left me alone. Thank God. I use the empty cafe as an advantage to have a good cry at the back and repeatedly tell myself that I was okay, splashing ice cold water in my face. When I went back to the storefront, I was surprised to see a new customer. An oldish man with graying hair dressed in a simple black jacket over jeans. I recognized his wonky smile and the whiteness of his hair. I used to poke it when I was a kid. My grandpa. It had been so long, and yet age had not changed him. I remember the last time I saw my grandpa. I was with Matilda and Levi, sitting in grandpa's living room, playing Crash Bandicoot. I could hear him and mom having a heated discussion in the kitchen, which ended in her storming out with tears staining her face. Mom looked helpless, terrified. She ushered the three of us up, lifting Matilda into her arms and pressing her face into my sister's hair. She didn't say a thing and left before picking up dad from work and driving east. Far east. I asked mom if she didn't like grandpa anymore. And she just laughed. But mom wasn't smiling. Her eyes were filled with something I couldn't yet understand. However, at that moment when my grandpa stepped toward me with a warm smile, part of me understood both my mother's words and Levi's warning. Someone is watching me. I could taste it on my tongue and feel the backs of my nostrils. Crushed fall leaves and spiced apples. The scent was overwhelming, almost sending me stumbling back. Phoebe. Grandpa held out his arms for me to run into a hug like when I was a kid. But I stayed a stock still. His ancient eyes traveled up and down me, head to toe. You've gotten so big. I wasn't looking at him though. I was noticing the sudden glaring red seeping across the black and white tiled floor. Blood, so much of it, swimming around his shoes. I could just about see what was left of Johnny's body behind him. That was when I stumbled back, but Grandpa just took steps forward. No, no, it's all right. Phoebe, your mother has told me all about your condition. And I promise you, if you come with me, I can make it better. Okay? A Carlisle rite of passage that all of us take. Sweetie, that kind of power can turn back time, can heal the sick and dying. His eyes glinted with something twisted and inhuman. Something I thought I saw in Levi's smile earlier. Was this what a Carlisle was? Now. I just want you to tell me the date. He took another step forward, and that scent was making me dizzy, black spots dancing across my eyes. Panicking, my gaze went to the calendar on the counter. It's June, June 23rd, the summer solstice, he nodded. Usually, rite of passage takes place when the adolescent has reached their early adulthood. He shook his head. Since we have been able to find you and make sure this ritual takes place, the power has spread unevenly among you. Grandpa's eyes darkened. Your brother is an extremely powerful witch. Far too powerful. Your sister has more power and ability than her brain can deal with. Both of them are living in pain and are yet stubborn enough to continue killing themselves. He scoffed. I told your mother 13 years ago that Proelium fight must take place to retain order, allowing our family's power to reside inside one sibling and can be passed on to the next Carlisle. He wasn't making sense. At least I thought he wasn't. I couldn't think straight. Before I could open my mouth, I was dropping to my knees, but there was no impact. I felt nothing. I could feel it. Sense it, taste it, and smell the thing twining its way through me, flowering and blooming inside my blood. I was on my back, staring dazedly at the ceiling. My head spinned off its axis. When Grandpa loomed over me, a sickening smile stretched across white wrinkled cheeks, giving me some insight into just how old he was. There could only be one Carlisle were the words which plunged me into darkness 
and straight back out again before I could register what was going on. My head swam. My head swam. Though opening my eyes, I could make out a dark room around me, lit up by an orangeade candlelight. I was sitting on a chair, my wrists bound to others. I didn't have to twist around to know who it was. Maddie's scent was slightly stronger, while Levi's was more sour than sweet. My head hurt. No, everything hurt. And being bound to them made me feel worse. I could sense and feel their power throoming from them, ignited in, ignited in their blood and bones. My gaze was drinking in the horrors of the room, which slowly were revealed through flickering candlelight. Shredded flesh and bones littered the ground, skeletons that were decades old, and then newer bodies that still looked warm, still looked like they had been breathing hours ago. Looking down, I was quite literally ankle deep in bones, bones that were crumbling, bones that were new and bones that were dust. There was no ground, only bodies, bricks stained intense red, splatters of it everywhere I looked. Levi broke the silence when I was squirming in my chair, biting back a screech, climbing its way up to my throat. I hate to tell you this. My brother's voice was more of a mumbled slur and I could sense he'd been hit over the head. But I told you so. He didn't bother struggling, which was very un-Levi. I figured both of my siblings were powerful enough to get out of the restraints, but apparently not. I was culminating words in my mouth to scream to my grandpa, who was strangely nowhere to be seen, when the old fuck himself appeared seemingly out of nowhere, brandishing a wide smile. Phoebe? I am aware you quit magic several years ago, so this question is not for you. Grandpa cleared his throat. Would the two of you like to answer my question? What question? Because it's charmed, Maddie whispered, her voice hoarse. She let out a sob. We can't get out of this because you use a charm rope, and if we struggle, it will climb inside our skin and restrain our organs one by one. Squeezing them to dust, Levi finished with a hiss. That is child abuse. You're not children. Grandpa retorted, his tone growing dark. You and your imbecile of a mother are the reason why our powers are faltering. Why our women are failing to conceive. He was suddenly in front of me, his face twisted and contorted into a grotesque monster. And why am I spending my Friday even taking part in a ritual which should have been done two years ago? Two years ago, we're on the cusp of adulthood. Both witches and humans. Two years ago, I would have been a lot less angry, Levi. Because I did not want it to have to come to this. Kidnapping my grandchildren and forcing them into their own rite of passage? <laughs> Every young witch has to go through this, and your mother did not speak a word to you. Dad. Something cold crept down my spine, and I lifted my head. I was suddenly a child again, terrified, and only wanting my mom. Dad. Mom was slamming her fists in a wooden door. I couldn't see. She was hysterical, screaming, crying our names. Grandpa sighed, straightening up. You won't be able to get through this barrier, Marley, he said loudly. What would you rather have, huh? One extremely powerful child, a Carlisle witch born and bred to be in our coven, or three dysfunctional brats, one with a disease who can't even do magic. He spurted out a laugh. And the other two who are scorching their own brains with knowledge and power which is uneven, which is not used to being shared between three souls, three bodies. I felt my restraints come loose suddenly, but I couldn't move. I am allowing things that have been wrong to become right. 
Grandpa said softly. So, I have let you go. You have as long as it takes to fully embrace the power and become the full-blooded witch you are destined to be. I noticed he was talking to all three of us, and yet not speaking a name. You can use magic or more human ways to get what you want. The first sibling to take all of the power and kill their other halves wins. Part of me understood what he meant. Sort of. He was right in saying we were practically entwined together, sharing thoughts and feelings. Why we had that connection as little kids and as teenagers, and no matter how much I tried to deny it, as adults too. Wait, Levi let out a shuddery breath. Are you, are you telling us to fucking kill each other? <laughs> no, Levi. Grandpa chuckled. I felt his skeletal fingers wrapping around my elbow and roughly pulling me to my feet. I stumbled, stamping on the floor of the bones. I am telling you to rip the power which resides in each of you and take it for yourself. I did it. Your mother, no matter how much she denies it, also spilled blood to become the dominant sibling. I sensed Maddie trying to stumble away, and I was paralyzed. I couldn't move, standing on crushed skulls and entrails dried into the ground. The banging of mom's fist slamming into the wood wasn't enough to snap me out of it. She was screeching, but mom was just fighting with a barrier. Grandpa stepped back, spreading out his arms. If you refuse, then I will choose myself. I could see the curve of his smile and the smattering of the candlelight. And do you really want to know who my favorite grandchild is? Until that moment, I had never known what Carlisle blood is. Why our coven, why our family had lasted for so long. But slowly as I regained my footing and managed to stumble back, my eyes glued to my sister, leaping at my brother with not her magic first, but her fists. I realized that our family was not peaceful like mom tried to preach, because the second my siblings and I was threatened with the possibility of death and that power, even useless in me being taken away, something snapped. Carlisles were not a community of magical beings horrified at the idea of hurting a human. No, this is what she tried to take us away from, the animalistic and feral side of the Carlisle. I saw it on Grandpa, and right then, I saw it in my sister. Her lips were curled into a snarl like something had taken over. Her fingers went for the throat, and I caught the pull of red glistening over her palms. Maddie's lips moved in a spell, her lips already spread into a satisfied grin and drawing her brother's blood, her gaze momentarily finding me. I was next but I don't think she was expecting Levi to be 10, no, 50 steps ahead of her already. With no blood drawn, already a pro at siphoning, probably from the blood around us on the ground, my brother threw out his hands, a wave of energy hitting Maddie directly in the chest. Winded, she tried to get up, tried to this time scream out a spell before he was in front of her in two strides. Gripping Maddie by the scalp, Levi lifted her into the air and threw her into the wall, which crumbled under her weight. This time Maddie did get up, and her eyes, oh God, her eyes were not my sister's eyes. Is this what was living inside us? What was lying in wait, waiting for us to become adults where it could blossom in full force? It wasn't just my sister's eyes. When Levi wrapped his fingers around her neck, choking my sister until her face was blue and then purple. It was in him too, far too much power for him to deal with or understand. A scorching fire in his brain, but he liked it. He was reveling in it. His lips were stretched wide into a glistening bloodthirsty grin as he reached forward and plunged his hand into my sister's chest. I was aware of dropping to my knees when Maddie dropped to the ground, and something scarlet was dripping from his hands, fingers that he squeezed together, 
crushing my sister's heart, which was a mess of red, a bleeding red, still alive thing in his hands, to dust. Grandpa made a noise of satisfaction behind us, and I found myself eye to eye with my brother, who was already coming towards me, dismissing our dead sister. His eyes were dead, pools of blackness and oblivion spiraling into what must have been what a Carlisle was. He took one step, and I remembered how to move. Suddenly, my sister's death was at the back of my mind, and I was being driven by pure adrenaline. It sent me ducking and grasping the first thing I could get a hold of, a piece of skull. I did not have powers, or I did, but I couldn't use them. That was the thought which was thrumming through me, but something else was waking up inside me, which sent me towards Levi. My hands were not shaking. I was not screaming at him or crying. I was completely calm. Grandpa's words were in my head, promises of a power that could heal me so I could use magic again. As if mom could read my mind, she cried out my name, but her voice was null to me. At that moment, it didn't exist because I was greedy. I had seen an already powerful person absorb our sister's power and hungry for mine. Slowly, I dragged the sharp edge of the skull across my palm, the sting of pain only pushing me further towards Levi. He did not hesitate. There was no goodbye, no sorry, no nothing. He was covered in our sister, every part of him stained and defaced. That took me off guard. I was trying to remember the spell to paralyze someone, well aware that my wound was not healing warm red pulling down my wrist and arm. Before I could mutter a spell, my head was already lurching back in his attempt to snap it. This isn't fair, Levi said when he pinned me against the same crumble rock Maddie had lost her heart, lost her power. He put just enough pressure on my throat, finger by finger, blocking my oxygen supply. Levi turned his head towards our grandpa, his lips curling into a smile. I'm your favorite grandchild, right? He said, which was enough time for me to mutter a spell to temporarily muddle his thoughts. But when I whispered it, squeezing my eyes shut and siphoning the blood from my wound, nothing happened. It would make sense that after so long of not doing magic, my powers wouldn't work as well. But I didn't think they would be completely gone. Before I could come up with another spell, I caught movement my brother's fists reaching forwards, fingers grazing my shirt, and ready to pull out my heart. I tried to shove him back, muttering spells that only made half sense, and nothing happened. I felt his hand go straight through my chest, before Levi was dragged back by an invisible force that this time sent him crumbling to the ground, his head hitting solid rock with a meaty smack. When I dropped to the ground, trying to regain my breath. I found myself at his side, shaking him. When he opened his eyes, they were back to normal, frowning at me in confusion. Before his gaze flicked past me, Levi's unfocused eyes widened, his lips mouthing soundless words before my grandpa's boot came down on his head, first knocking him unconscious, but then it kept going and going and going until my brother's brains were splattered on my hands and stone. I didn't register that Levi was dead until the stinging in my hands faded. My body going boiling hot and then ice cold. The hairs on the back of my neck standing up. I could feel it. Exactly what had reverberated and thrummed from my siblings was now in sight of me. Grandpa dug next to me, his icy cold breath tickling my ear. Turning away from my brother's corpse, I found him clutching a small purple vial, which appeared to be occupied. He slipped the vial into his jacket after a sharp look at Levi. His lips widened in a toothy grin. 
You, Phoebe, are my favorite grandchild. His sputtered laugh sent me recoiling back. Did you really think you fought to the death? No. No, sweetie. We already know which sibling is going to win. They are already chosen by the coven. He grabbed my arm and pulled me to my feet. Then, it is our responsibility to assure things play out the way they should. His words were still whirring in my skull when Mom wrapped her arms around me and screamed into my scalp. That night, half-conscious and struggling under this new power that continued to send me to my knees every time I stood, like a constant weight on my chest, I found myself wondering why Grandpa had that small purple vial in his hands. Last night, not even a month after the ritual, I was sitting on my laptop, trying to write what I am writing now, and failing before something sharp slashed my cheek. I grazed my fingers over the cut, which healed before it could fully bleed. But then it happened again, the other cheek, and it slash. Then, right across my stomach, a wound deep enough to scare me if I didn't have the ability to heal pretty much straight away. But then, it happened again before the flesh of my stomach could stitch itself back together. Across my forehead, my lips, my eyes, my arms and legs, blood pulling and staining my skin. It was so fast, so cruel, merciless. I jumped up, panic twisting my gut. Mom! Ever since the ritual, I was staying with Mom. I can't bring myself to go into my sibling's room yet. I was staggering to Mom's room when this time my hair was grabbed and tugged back violently. When I crashed to the ground, trying to remember spells I had never learned, it hit me that my grandpa was wrong. He appointed the wrong Carlisle witch, and they were making sure I knew that. Clawing hands and fingers, giggles following me into my bedroom, and then peeking behind the bedroom door when I locked myself in here, where familiar fingers wrapped around my neck, fingers pressed slowly and precise pressure. I knew exactly why I had been chosen to stay alive, while my siblings were murdered in cold blood, and why somehow they were so much more powerful as phantoms, stinking of crushed fall leaves and spiced apples. I heard Grandpa talking to NYU. I thought it was about their deaths, but Grandpa wasn't referring to Levi and Maddie as deceased. In fact, he was organizing another ritual. This one my mom was going to be a part of. I wasn't chosen as a Carlisle witch, the one who would carry on the family name. They were. This wasn't my rite of passage. It was theirs.